All right, hopefully this will tell me when it's actually started streaming. I'll be able to see it maybe on one of my other streams if it's working. Uh, hopefully, um, if, if you have joined me, then I would like to say welcome to today's um, MOA Live Talks. I believe this is working. I'm just going to double check. Maybe? Yes. Excellent. Um, so <laughs> uh, this is an experiment in a number of senses. So I'm trying live casting from Zoom. So I apologize if the camera is a bit grainy or if there are any tech hangups. Um, I'm, like I said, this is a bit of an experiment. Uh, I'm doing this so you have more to look at than just me. That's also where, why I'm wearing the headset today for a little bit clearer audio because I'm using my laptop instead of my phone. Um, hopefully everything goes smoothly. Um, if Zoom does cut out, I will transfer to Facebook uh, so that you can at least hear the rest of what I have to say, even if you can't see all the cool images that I have set up today. So today I am going to talk about a site in London that speaks uh, to some of the city's past that I don't think gets a lot of attention. Um, and that is the, um, or sorry, not a site, but yes. Um, and that, that, but that's our, gosh, I'm already, <laughs> all this technology has got me overwhelmed already. Um, so I'd like to talk about a site that, that relates to our city's um, heritage in a sense of us being a destination point uh, for the Underground Railroad. The site in, in question is known colloquially um, in London as the Fugitive Slave Chapel, and more formally um, as its archeological designation is uh, 275 Thames Street. So I've reached out to a few people uh, for some details for this talk. And so I would like to thank Dr. Holly Martell and Nicole Brandon of TMHC, and also uh, some of us Tim is Martell Heritage Consultants, and also Daryl Dan from the London branch of the uh, Ontario Archaeological Society, who were all involved in the original project um, and all gave me some materials or assistance for this talk. So as I'm sure everyone knows, um, the Underground Railroad uh, was a network of safe routes and hiding spaces used by people who were freeing or fleeing, sorry, gosh, uh, save rates. I'm going to try that again. Um, so the Underground Railroad was a network of safe routes and hiding spaces that were used by people fleeing slavery in the United States. So Canada, as part of the British Empire, abolished slavery in 1833, and this came into effect in 1834. So despite the fact that individuals who escaped slavery in the US were freed persons in Canada, they could still be recaptured by American slave catchers um, who could take them back across the border. So because of this, many people tried to settle in smaller communities uh, that were more remote or at least were further away from some of the major travel routes along the lakes, uh, which included London. So London was also relatively cheap for people to live in who had fled to a new country and may have had very little to their name when they arrived. Um, so from about 1830s or the 1830s to the 1860s, Thames Street was the heart of London's early black community and a landing spot for many new arrivals to London. And now I'm going to try to see if I can do this whole technology thing a little bit more fancy um, and get my PowerPoint going by screen sharing. There we go. All right, so you guys should be seeing an image of, of what Thames Street looked like in the 1850s. Um, this is one of many slides that was provided to me by Team HC, so thanks again. Um, so you can see sort of that runs sort of along uh, the riverway here. On this right, which is in, if for those of you who are not familiar with London, we have in fact gone that far and we have called the local river here the Thames as well um, in our attempt to imitate uh, real London. <coughs> so, Thames Street is located near the forks of the Thames River, which you don't see in this image. Um, and that it's really kind of, um, it's between Horton and King Street. So again, if you're not familiar with London, that won't mean a whole lot to you, although I will be showing you more of a, a larger map later. Um, and it's really on the edge of the developing city. So it's right up backed up against the river. So this point in time, this is sort of riverfront property is not really super desirable. And that's because um, it's swampy, it's prone to flooding, it's full of lots of mosquitoes. 
and it's really kind of a marginal area. So as a result, it's more affordable for people who are just coming into this space and who have very little to their name. So people had a chance to save up some money while they lived there, again, because it was relatively cheap, after which they tended to move inland into other areas of the city, uh, particularly around the neighborhood we now call Soho. Uh, again, <laughs> that's us trying to get that real London vibe. Um, but here it stands, stands for South of Horton, um, which is, again, uh, one of the major streets in this area. And as such, the area was important to the early Black community in London, uh, so this area of Thames Street. And this is probably why it was selected as a good place to build a church. So in 1847, uh, the lot at 275 Thames Street was leased to a William Clark and his wife, who turned around and leased it that same year to trustees from the African Methodist Church with the intent that they would build a building on that lot, uh, as a, build a church as a place for worship for members of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. So the church or a building that clearly matches its configuration is depicted in an, on a drawing of the street by 1855, which I should be able to show you here. You can see circled in yellow um, a depiction of what we think is actually the, the church building. Um, <clears throat> so the church or a building that clearly matches it in configuration is depicted on drawings of the street by 1855. So it was erected at some point uh, between 1847 and 1855 um, and sometime in that eight-year period but we're not exactly sure when. So the church was actually renamed the British Methodist Episcopal Church in 1856. Uh, and this was the first Black Methodist Church in London. And it played an important role in the Black community life in the 1850s and 1860s. So not only was it an important local gathering point, but as a colloquial name suggests, it continued to be an endpoint for Black US refugees seeking freedom via the Underground Railroad. It also played a role in the larger Black community of Upper Canada, so the sort of the broader Ontario region, um, as a gathering place. So there are some accounts that John Brown, who is a famous American abolitionist who, among other things, um, led the raid on Harper's Ferry in Virginia in 18. 1959, which contributed to the beginning of the U.S. Civil War, um, that he held a meeting at this church to recruit for his cause in 1858. So this was a pretty important place, um, not just for London, but for uh, the Black community more broadly in what would become Ontario. So by the eight, late 1860s, the heart of the Black community in London was shifting, and a new church was erected at 430 Gray Street. Uh, consequently, they sold the original church building at 275 Tam Street in 1869 uh, to a cooper named John Seal. Uh, so the new building at uh, Gray Street is still a church today. It's the Beth Emanuel Church. Um, and the original church building served as a private residence. And while it went through several structural changes, it was privately occupied until it was purchased by a transportation company in 2001. Um, so it was recognized as a site of historic and cultural importance by the London Historical Sites Committee in 1986 and a pla plaque, sorry, was erected on the site. And I'm just going to go through a couple more slides here. So this is um, actually from 1926. And so it's showing you an image of what the building looked in 1926. Um, so quite a while ago now, <laughs> almost 100 years ago, um, you can see in that period, it was still uh, wooden framed uh, well, it's still wooden frame, but it's still got this outside wooden uh, facade. Um, and you can see here a little bit of uh, the history that was known about it at the time in the in the mid 20s. So, um, you know, they, they, they recognized even then that it had this important um, history to it, even though it's, it is really kind of a small building. Um, so here it is here. Um, on Thames Street in, in 2013. Uh, this is an image that's taken from the TMHC website. And here you can see a, just a more close up building um, of what it looked like in 2013 when this project took place. You can see that a lot of the wood paneling has been in, uh, covered or replaced with the sort of brick facade. <clears throat> so then to talk a little bit more about the project, oh, well, that's fine. Um, it, um, it was cool not only because of the history that's represented by the building and the property, but because of the way the community got involved. So the project got a lot of publicity because of the history of the building, of course, um, um, and it was originally slated for demolition, but after there was some public outcry, um, it was decided to move it instead. And it now sits on a lot of the Beth Emanuel Church on Gray Street. And that's the slide that you can see right now. You can see uh, 275 Thames Street and then up in the right-hand corner, you can see the location of the Beth Emanuel Church. Um, I think I might just need to move my little 
zoom can go here. Um, you can see it's really not that far away. It's maybe about a 25 minute walk between these two locations. So when we talk about the community shifting, it's really not that far. Like it is much more um, into London. It's further away from the river, but it's not a huge distance. Like it wouldn't have been, um, it, it would have been relatively simple for people to, to, to remain connected between these two community points, but nevertheless, they did move the church. Um, both they moved it in the 18, uh, in 1869, they, they, they uh, sold the old church and uh, moved the heart of the community, but they also physically moved it in 2013, I believe, from Thames Street to over to Gray Street. Um, so, uh, they, as I said, they had decided to move it. Um, it they did in the end um, after the archaeological project. Um, so the city, having been contacted by people in the heritage community, agreed to contribute some funds towards an investigation of the property. Uh, towards an, uh, and so, however, most of the work was, most of the archaeological work was undertaken on a volunteer basis. Uh, so Timmins Martell Heritage Consultants, or TMHC, was contracted to manage the project, uh, which they did with assistance from Daryl Dan of the OAS. Um, so TMHC is located in London. They're actually on the museum grounds. Um, and they've been very active in promoting and investigating the archaeology of the Black community um, in Ontario, Black communities in Ontario. So this was something that was already sort of really in their wheelhouse to do. Um, so there was additionally community volunteers were involved over the nine days of the stage four project, uh, uh, for the field project rather, for a total of about 810 volunteer hours. So that's a lot of people giving their time or a lot of time given by people. Um, for this project. So people who had no experience in archaeology were supervised and assisted by experienced archaeologists from TMHC. Uh, the project uncovered a lot of artifacts and eight features, um, but most of which were sort of small refuse pits. And I've got some images here just to give you a sense of the project and the, scape, the, the scope of it. So it's, you can see it's not really a very large yard that they're working in. It's just a, a sort of small small space. Um, here's some, some folks here working on some excavation squares, um, a, an image of some volunteers who are working on the project. Um, again, just to sort of give a sense of how this came together as a community project. Um, uh, some of the finds that were, the, this was an image that was taken of the field. There was a lot of bottles recovered. Um, and then also this, this cool pipe, which we'll leave up as our, our splash image while I move on to talking about a few other things. Um, so processing, oh, maybe not. So processing the artifacts also relied on marshalling a lot of support from the community. And it was undertaken in the public lab of the Museum of Ontario Archaeology, and again was supervised by Daryl Dan of the local OAS. So around 30 dedicated volunteers um, gave their time <clears throat> to wash and sort of the recovered materials. Um, and the youngest of the volunteers who were involved in this part of the project was actually nine years old, which just sort of goes to show it's never too young to foster an interest in responsible archaeology. Um, so some of the volunteers at this stage got involved in the research as well. So they might have found something that was really cool. They're going through the washing and sorting and they might and they took some of their own time outside of the lab to sort of research uh, what some of these objects were. Uh, so the project also involved data entry to prep the collection prof for professional analysis, again, by a more experienced TMHC lab staff. So all told, there was about 336 volunteer hours that went into this part of the project. So you can see like between this and the field work, the time that the community gave to this structure and to this project was pretty significant. I um, mean, you can read more about it and even see some of the interviews on our website. Um, if you search for Fugitive Slave Chapel, uh, which is the, the title the project was known by um, at the time. And there's also a write-up on the TMHC website that I will try and link in the comments later. Um, so you can see some volunteers here. Uh, Daryl is a, the gentleman that's standing in the foreground um, and they're working on uh, washing and sorting artifacts from this project. So in 2014, uh, the museum put together an exhibit on some of the preliminary work that showcased some of the artifacts that were found, some of which were pretty interesting. And I'm gonna just show you some of them here. Um, once again, some of these are images that were taken uh, while the exhibit was being set up, but some of them were provided to me more recently by Team HC, so thank you, Nicole. Um, and we'll just go through some of these guys. Um, so there's this cool uh, French poste telegraph button. So this is from the French uh, post office and telegraph office. Like, why is it in this particular area at the time? Hard to say. Um, so there's these other buttons. Um, 
and various other materials. So this has also got some collar studs here. There's a cuff link, a corset clasp, a bead, um, some jewelry pieces, and also a buckle. So just some like neat small finds from this site uh, of different, different materials. You can see I kind of like that button with a little fruit on it um, that's on the second row. We've also got um, some other kind, neat sorts of small finds. We've got this toothbrush here, the, this top line here. You can see the toothbrush um, is got, you know, part of the head of it and also part of the handle. On the bottom row, we have the, the head of a safety razor. And over on the right here, we have um, a little scrap of metal that reads McCormick's. Um, so this is uh, possibly a label from uh, a biscuit or confectionery tin uh, from the local McCormick's factory that was established by Th Thomas McCormick in London in 1854. So kind of a neat uh, local object. There's also a glass cutter, which I thought was a, a pretty cool object to find. Um, we have got some toys. So there's this doll head um, that was dated to around the sometime in the 1890s excuse me, we've got another small doll hand here. And you can see it obviously doesn't go with the same doll just based on the scale of it. Uh, we've got this little pitcher that would have belonged to probably a child's play set. And then we have a bone domino as well. So just sort of some objects of like leisure uh, for various age groups. Uh, we've also got some marbles. Uh, so these marbles started becoming popular around 1884. Um, and then down in the lower left of this, we also have a stray, another stray button, uh, but Marbles again, and a, a game, so leisure time, especially for children. We've got some various pipes along with the one that I showed you earlier um, in it that was found in the field. This one down here with the face on it is an, an effigy face. Um, these are white uh, kaolin clay, so they are most likely, uh, well, they're certainly industrial produced materials. Um, We've also got this really, there was a lot, I said, a, a lot of different bottles recovered. This one I thought was kind of uh, fun just because of the name of it. So it's a medicine bottle. It's called King of the Blood. Um, so this was a, a patent medicine that was created by D. Ransom Sons and Co. or Sun and Co. in the 1870s. Um, so advertisements about it stated that it cures all humors from a common eruption to the worst scrofula. Um, so it's supposed to purify the blood um, by displacing any and all diseases. So it could cure, theoretically, it claimed it could cure uh, cancer, female weakness disease, uh, fevers, and chronic ailments. Uh, and that, you know, these could all be cured by this most powerful corrector. So I just kind of love these crazy 19th century patent medicines and the things they claimed they could do. Um, we've also got a Vaseline bottle. So Vaseline was patented um, in... 1872 by Robert Augustus Cheesebro. Uh, I hope I'm saying that correctly. He was a chemist who was working in the oil business. Um, he had an interest in making medical products from petroleum. Um, and he came up with the Vaseline based on the German word for water, which is Wasser, and the Greek word for oil, which is oilian. So that's where you get Vaseline, I guess. Um, we've also got this cool local bottle. Um, so this is a Joseph Bilton soda bottle. And Joseph Bilton was a manufacturer of soda water pop and uh, mineral water between 1864 and 1903 um, in London. So he ran his own business and also teamed up with his brother, who was Edward S. Bilton, as the Bilton Brothers. Um, so in the London City and Middlesex County Directory of 1886, Joseph Bilton was listed as a soda water manufacturer list, uh, located at 263 Dundas Street, so right in the heart of London. So the characteristics of the bottle indicate that it was made um, no earlier than and within, uh, so no earlier, sorry, yeah, than this 1892, I guess, based on its uh, characteristics. And we know that since his business closed in 1903, it had to have been made sort of between those dates of 1892 and 1903. So that gives us sort of a nice tight uh, date for the assemblage that this bottle is part of. Um, and then the final thing I'm going to show you off here is the sugar, so a little sugar dish um, that has an image of the Toronto Normal School on it. So this was made by the Staffordshire film, uh, so Staffordshire in England, of Wallace Gimson and Co. Um, it's a registered, or they registered a multi strain pattern entitled The World, The World, very fancy, um, at the Patent Office in London, um, again in the late 18. 80s, I think. And the general composition here was uh, asymmetric, asymmetrical, sort of placed off center with images of notable buildings and scenery from around the world. And so this piece, uh, which was found intact, shows the Grand Battery at, um, at Quebec on the other side, side, and then again, the Toronto Normal School 
on the face that we're showing off here. And then I also have an image of it uh, from the field. Because um, <clears throat> as I said, it was found intact, which is just kind of a neat thing. <clears throat> so um, I'll just leave this one up for now, I guess. Um, so what does the archaeology then actually tell us from this site? Well, um, so sort of to manage expectations a little bit, I think it's important to recognize that though the church building's early history is both important and interesting, both the building and the site had a long history of use um, beyond that initial early function. So it was really a church for maybe about 20 years and a private residence for much, much longer than that. Um, so the other is that only a small fraction of the site has been excavated. So a lot of it still remains um, in the area under a lot of parking lots. And, um, so there are features that we might expect to be related to these kinds of public buildings like a church, uh, like a privy, for example, um, that were not uncovered during the 2013 field project. So privies are prime spots for discards of all kinds of items. So it is a shame that this one wasn't uncovered. Although again, not all the property has been excavated to date. So all of this is to say that most of the materials that were covered actually date to the later periods of occupation. Um, once the church had been sold and the black community was starting to be centered in Soho around Gray Street, uh, which is where the new church was located. So we don't know very much about the people who brought, bought the property from the church, other than that John Seal was a cooper. So we don't know if they were members of the black community, for instance, um, but what we can say is the artifacts that were recovered from this, uh, from this later occupation uh, from the 1870s through the 1920s are, are very similar to other artifact assemblages that are found around London and in Toronto. So they really reflect a more general sense of the material culture of that period more broadly. So then does this mean uh, that the it wasn't worth doing all that work, that it wasn't worth bringing all these volunteers together if we didn't learn anything specifically about the early black community. Well, of course it was still valuable, um, both as a community effort, a chance to feel connected to history, especially to early black history um, in the city, and to learn more about how archeology span is practiced in the field and in the lab. So that's a really cool learning opportunity. Um, and we're, we were, as a museum, glad to be involved in that. Um, <clears throat> We could also learn things about the period where we do have archaeological finds. And the fact that this area that had been considered pretty marginal is starting to look more like the rest of the city helped us understand how London was developing. So while research is still ongoing, um, it could also help us uh, let us say more about this period of transition in the Black community as well as people who were, were moving with the church. And finally, as the area was, that was excavated was quite small, we know that there is still a lot of potential archaeology uh, that remains there. So a lot of artifacts and features um, that relate to the early back community and the church that are still could be discovered in the area. So if there is more development in that part of the city around Thames Street, there could still be a chance for us to uncover them in the future and to learn more. So we know that that material is probably still there. So that's all for this talk. Thank you again for joining me. Hopefully all the technology worked properly and I actually made it through to the end and you're all still with me. Um, thanks again to Dr. Holly Martell, Nicole Brandon, and Daryl Jan for all the information and assistance that they provided. And on Thursday, please join me from the museum. So I've got to go back in to do some regular checks on equipment um, and on the collections. So I'm going to be preventing, presenting from there to talk a little bit about the archaeological repository. So I hope that you will join me then. Um, and thank you. Have a great day.